Councillor Hugh Thomas is um, the leader of the Cardiff Council and is the Welsh Local Government Association spokesperson for culture, tourism and major events. She's also the Core Cities UK Cabinet member with responsibility for culture. Uh, he was elected in May 2017 and prioritises tackling inequality and clean and sustainable growth in Cardiff um, and also supports uh, culture and the arts. Hugh has worked in a number of industries, including IT, transport, and most recently, international development, where he was the head of Christian Aid Wales. Uh, today, he's here to present Creativity at the Heart of the Future. Good afternoon, and, and thanks for the, for the invitation to, to speak to you here today. Can I say, just say how pleased I am um, that events like these are taking place, bringing together uh, academics as, with policy developers and policy implemented, implementers, which I think in local governments uh, we think of ourselves as being. Um, I think there's a sweet spot somewhere there in, in the interaction between leading research uh, and practical, uh, practical experience. And in that sweet spot is where innovation happens. Uh, and frankly, I think this needs to happen a lot more, not just on, on this topic, but uh, uh, across a whole range of subjects. Um, you know, as the leader of, of Cardiff, a city which, according to Lonely Planet, dances to its own beat, and also as uh, somebody whose first degree uh, is in music, uh, I, I'm really quite excited about the chance to talk to you today about culture uh, and the arts, and more broadly about creativity uh, within uh, the modern British city. And in particular, I'd like to consider the role, the role creativity has played in transforming our cities, and the role it must continue to play uh, in our cities going forward to the future. So, for those of you um, unfamiliar with Cardiff, uh, let me begin by telling you a bit of our, of our history. Uh, it rose to prominence uh, off the back of South Wales Valley's coal, basically. Uh, in 1851, it was uh, nothing more than a town of 27,000 people. Uh, 50 years later, uh, it had grown to 170,000 people, uh, based on exporting that tons and tons and tons and thousands of tons of coal. And it was investment in infrastructure, the canals, uh, the railways, the docks and the ports, which meant that Cardiff and not its neighbouring coastal ports, Newport or Barry, uh, which had the capacity and was best placed uh, to take advantage of uh, what was at the time the region's black gold. It became in fact the biggest coal exporting port in the world, powering the Industrial Revolution, uh, with the price of coal uh, on the European market being set in Cardiff's coal exchange. Uh, where in 1904 the first ever uh, million pound uh, cheque was, was signed. Fast forward, of course, uh, sorry, that's the coal exchange, that's the trading floor. Fast forward, of course, to the 70s and the 80s, uh, and Cardiff, like many British cities, went through uh, the painful process of deindustrialisation. Uh, you know, it, it hit British cities hard. Professor Michael Parkinson uh, refers to British, British cities at this time as, as basket cases. What you've got there is um, East Moors uh, Steelworks. Uh, it's actually in the ward I represent, uh, or was. Uh, it was in James Callaghan's constituency, uh, and it actually closed down during the time uh, that he was Prime Minister. I think kind of uh, emphasising that even you know, at the highest level of government, the, the change that was happening in our cities uh, was, uh, was pretty unpreventable. Uh, and deindustrialization, of, co of course, brought with it recession, it brought mass unemployment uh, and the dereliction of many communities. Uh, and for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, during this period, you saw Cardiff's population decline. Uh, and of course, during the 80s, we, we uh, had the, you know, the, the infamous case of, of British government in, in some cases accepting uh, managed decline uh, in some British cities. So Cardiff was a, was a grey, decaying city, provincial, struggling to come to terms uh, with the decline uh, of the big industries and the job losses that had led to. So you may be wondering, why, why am I talking about coal and not creativity, uh, not, uh, not music, but manufacturing? Why deindustrialization, not culture? Well, it's because of what happened afterwards. Cardiff's response to the economic shocks of deindustrialization de was based on a significant program of culture and sport-led regeneration. As heavy industry collapsed, sports and culture 
uh, areas of competitive, competitive advantage for a capital city like Cardiff uh, were recognised as, uh, as being the opportunity and when uh, then were brilliantly and inventively used to, to transform the city. So in partnership with the private sector, the infrastructure was put in place to attract international events and visitors, raise the city's profile and improve quality of life. It started with the construction of St David's Hall, which became the National Concert Hall of Wales in the mid-80s. Uh, a bold decision uh, for a city council at a time, uh, even then, of squeezing public sector, uh, public sector uh, finances. And then it was supercharged, of course, by the regeneration of Cardiff Bay in the 1980s, transforming uh, a scene like this <coughs> to this. And it remains, I think, one of the biggest uh, waterfront regeneration exercises ever seen in Europe. That, in turn, uh, uh, assisted and led to uh, the, the decision to build the National Assembly for Wales at the heart uh, of a new uh, regenerated bay. Further north in the sea centre, you had the construction of the Millennium Stadium, now known uh, officially as the Principality, but we're still getting used to that. Uh, that hosted the Rugby World Cup. Uh, in 1989, hosted uh, a series of FA Cup finals uh, whilst Wembley was being rebuilt, and this was done far cheaper than Wembley, um, I, I might add. In 2004, you had the uh, opening of the Wales Millennium Centre, uh, uh, a centre for opera uh, down in the, in the heart of the bay. Uh, and you know, all of these were landmark developments uh, based around culture and sports, culminating, I think, uh, most spectacularly, uh, last year when Cardiff hosted uh, the 2017 UEFA Champions League final. Uh, when you look at the list of cities that have hosted this previously, Berlin, Milan, uh, Athens, Istanbul, these are major world cities. Cardiff is a, a city of 350,000 people. You know, we, we are not a big city, uh, and yet through this concerted strategy over 30 years, putting culture and sport at the heart of our development agenda, uh, we are uh, punching way above our weights and putting Cardiff uh, on, a, on, a national, on a national platform. What's the impact of that then? Well, Cardiff is now one of the youngest, fastest growing uh, cities in the UK. In fact, uh, with our population projected to grow over 20% in the next 20 years, that would make us the fastest growing UK city, growing faster than, than the rest of Wales uh, put together. We're one of Britain's most skilled cities half of our workforce is educated to degree level or higher, and visitor numbers have doubled to record levels over the last decade. Employment growth is faster than in all the core cities, and unemployment is at its lowest levels since 2009. And I think it's fair to say that the world, and I hope it's fair to say, that the world sees Cardiff uh, and the way we see ourselves uh, in a different light <coughs> to what it was 30 years ago, from a struggling, provincial British city to a modern European capital city. It's not a story that's unique to Cardiff. Uh, you will recognise, I'm sure, the use of culture and the arts and sport as a force for re regeneration in many cities like Glasgow, uh, like Liverpool, like, like Bilbao in Spain. The big question uh, for Cardiff and for leaders of cities like these uh, right now is this. Following the economic crash and the Great Recession, does a focus on culture and sports as a driver of the visitor and the leisure economy and as a means of positioning your city in the crowded marketplace for talent and investment, does that still hold true? And if it does, how can it be still delivered in an era of austerity? And I'll talk a bit more about you know, Cardiff's perspective because the story I've just presented there is really the story of the marketing brochures. Uh, I think, you know, if we're being candid, the truth is far more nuanced. Because despite Cardiff's strong economic performance, the proceeds of Cardiff's growth have not been enjoyed by all the city's residents. The gap between the most and least prosperous communities uh, is too big and has grown during that period, with economic inequalities aligning closely with health and educational inequalities in the city. Yes, jobs are being created, but over the last 10 years, real wages in the city are lower, with many working families finding themselves below the poverty line. It's not a story that's unique to Cardiff, but it is something, as a local authority, we feel we have to grapple with. Home ownership 
it's beyond the reach of too many people, uh, and many of whom, uh, by the nature of their employment, uh, characterised by low pay, insecurity, have got no prospect of getting on that housing ladder. Throw challenges like Brexit into that mix, as well as everything that led to Brexit, in my view, public sector austerity, a feeling of powerlessness uh, in the face of uh, political changes, but also in the face of technological changes. Where does that leave us? Is investment in culture really the answer? Let me tell you, when we as an authority look on how on earth you carry on funding children's <laughs> services, tackling homelessness, or helping vulnerable older people stay in their homes, arguing for more funding for culture is a really, really tough ask. And it's a tough sell to the community at large. But even so, I'm convinced that it does remain a big part of the long-term answer to the challenges we face. Now, why is that? Well, it's the link between culture and creati creativity. And that is what then makes the economic case stack up. The UK's creative economy is a great national strength. It accounts for almost 10% of our national GVA and, there, and around two and a half million jobs. We, as a country, are a world leader in art, in theatre, in fashion, uh, computer games development, music, TV, you name it. If it's creative, we are there. And growing the creative and cultural footprint of the UK must therefore be good for UK PLC. And cities are increasingly being recognised as creative hotspots, hotspots, with their own distinct identity, cultural institutions, companies, artists and entrepreneurs. And you see that in the numbers in Cardiff. The creative economy in Cardiff alone generates about a billion pounds annually of GVA for the city's economy. And each year, uh, uh, sorry, and, and in the creative industry, around 15,000 people are employed. Now that's more than ever worked in that steelworks I showed you earlier. In fact, Nesta, uh, Nesta's latest Creative Nation report described Cardiff as one of the UK's largest creative sectors outside of London. So beyond, beyond the inherent value of arts and culture, there is an economic imperative in getting this right. And the relationship between arts and cultural clustering and the wider economic performance <coughs> is proven. Skilled workers will often sacrifice higher salaries to live in places with a vibrant cultural scene, somewhere where uh, they enjoy living and can afford to live. Put simply, young, skilled people, I still think of myself as young uh, on, a, on, on a good days, you know, they are willing uh, to earn less if they live somewhere they enjoy living in, if they live in somewhere that's got a cool vibe to it. And in turn, a vibrant cultural scene leads to higher wages for workers within the creative economy. And when it comes to culture, cities are also a connecting point between the UK and the rest of the world, providing an international stage for the best UK talent and bringing the best international talent to the UK. It goes without saying how critical that will be uh, from March 2019 and beyond. That is why culture and the creative economy must remain at the heart of our city development plans. Now, so far, the images I've shared with you show how regeneration has changed Cardiff over the last 20 years. But the truth is, you can't rest on your laurels uh, and think regeneration uh, has a final point. It must be a continuous process. So over the last few years, uh, we've entered the latest phase uh, of, of that regeneration, focusing initially on the city's main business district, north and south of our central train station. Those of you who haven't been to Cardiff for a couple of years, um, I think you're in for a bit of a shock uh, when you next step off the train uh, in, Cardiff, in Cardiff Central because uh, most of that there now is built, totally transforming what was uh, a pretty gloomy bus station uh, just, just five years ago. Yes, there are grade A office spaces in there and of course commercial and retail venues as you'd expect in any city centre development. But front and centre of that regeneration programme <coughs> is the new headquarters for BBC Wales, which is probably the city's biggest single creative industry player, front and centre of the latest phase of our regeneration scheme. And then, with the schemes to the north of the station uh, nearing completion, 
we turn our attention south of the railway station as well uh, to regenerate uh, what has been a, a, a brewery site uh, right in the, in the city centre. So we're going to retain <coughs> the historic buildings there, but also bringing in a mix of office spaces, mixed residential, and most crucially as an anchor, a, a new digital campus for one of the city's universities. And on that point of universities, make no mistakes that we see building creativity into our education system as critical for Cardiff's future success. Because it's those children who are able to think creatively, to adapt and to, and to invent, who will be best able to respond to challenges like automation that will soon be disrupting the job markets. Now the curriculum in Wales is finally undergoing uh, a much needed uh, overhaul. And alongside this, we are putting initiatives into place as a city authority, um, uh, initiatives like the Cardiff Commitment, to link pupils uh, in, in our schools directly with employment opportunities in creative sectors, but also in others. But making that golden thread run from the school education through further and higher education into employers, making sure that whatever's people, whatever people's background, they have the best chance possible of accessing uh, jobs in whatever industry they want to work in. So across all aspects of city life, we see culture as making a big difference. It brings people together, it builds a sense of pride and identity. It creates shared experiences, it strengthens the bonds and fosters understanding between communities. And that in itself is also so important at times when there are some out there who would say that there are more that divides us than unites us. The case for culture and creativity is compelling. But there is an elephant in the room, isn't there? It's money. How do you fund all this? Public funding uh, over the last 50 years has been the cornerstone of UK culture. And what is more, in, mo in most city regions, uh, I'm talking not just about the central urban region, but the, the, the surrounding areas, the funding for those cultural activities that take place at the core will often come from the city council with limited funding coming in from the surrounding authorities. But we've talked about austerity, the traditional approach to funding and supporting culture in core cities uh, isn't just creaking, I think it's approaching a point of crisis. We need new solutions and radical changes. And the central thrust of my presentation thus far has been about why culture must be supported. The critical second question is how do you do that? And that's why Core Cities, the group of uh, the 10 largest UK cities, initiated uh, the, creative, the, the, the Cultural Cities Inquiry, uh, which has got support and buy-in from all four Arts, Council, Arts Councils, uh, has got represent, representation from the Key Cities groups, from, from London Councils, from Academia, uh, and from the private sector, and it's chaired by uh, the Chief Exec of Virgin Money, uh, Jane Ann Guardia. For that work to be a success, we need to set out a series of practical recommendations that will enable city leaders and cultural institutions to make the best use of available resources and set up new channels of investment, whilst enabling central government to unlock new streams of revenue rather than just simply asking them to reprioritise how they currently spend existing money. But we do believe that, given the right, given the right policy levers, cities can add to the UK's formidable reputation as a creative power, powerhouse. Now, the outcome of the, of the inquiry will report uh, over the coming months, uh, probably uh, in, in January, January 2019. So uh, I'm not going to go into any of the findings today, uh, not least because they are still being, being finalised. But I will say this. You'd expect me to say austerity is wrong-headed wrong and needs to end. You know, I'm a, I'm a Labour politician, after all. But if there's going to be less money for culture and the arts, then for me, three things need to happen. Firstly, cities need to be given more freedom to create our own funding streams. Across the board, greater local flexibilities I see as key to the success uh, of, of UK cities. At the moment, we only have access to between 5 and 7% of, uh, of our tax base. This is less than the OECD average. In North America, in North American cities are close to 50% of, of spending their own tax base. You look at what happened in Bilbao, 
uh, they secured the, Gug the Guggenheim in Bilbao because uh, the city government there had freedoms on local spending and tax retention that UK cities frankly couldn't even dream of. In New York, the development of leading cultural institutions, including the Museum of Modern Art and the Metropolitan Museum, they were carried out through a local trust, which allowed the issuing of cultural bonds, triple tax exempt debt and borrowing to fund that growth. So we need to get inventive and innovative about local sources of generating funding. And we need to be given the freedom by government to do so. That's all I'd say on that for now, but look out in January for when the inquiry reports. The second thing that needs to happen in my view is that we need to get a lot smarter <coughs> about how we use the resources we have, financial, physical and human. This is really about setting an agreed vision for culture and the arts within a city that all the major players uh, can agree priorities and then coordinate their resources to get behind the delivery of that vision. And the third point, which relates to the second, is to realise that it's not all about the money. There are inventive things that can be done with land, with spaces, uh, with levers like licensing and planning that will protect and enhance the arts. But this requires an ecosystem approach where functions like planning and licensing are also deployed in support of the arts, not closing them down uh, as has too often been the case. Now, now I know that some of the other speakers today uh, have been talking about the, the role of, her of heritage buildings <coughs> and planning in shaping the culture of our cities. Let me say, uh, let me say this, at its best, Heritage buildings can transform our sense of place and enhance the perception of cities on the international stage. Take these examples, for example, of um, how Cardiff Castle, uh, it's a building that dates back to Roman times, uh, was integrated into some of the major events uh, that we've hosted in Cardiff, giving a strong uh, definition, I think, both to residents and vis visitors alike, that they were not in any city, but that they were in Cardiff. Uh, and I can reassure the, uh, arch the archaeologists in the room that no ancient building was damaged in, uh, in, in the making of any of those photos. We're lucky in Cardiff because Cardiff Castle uh, is a public asset. It's in, uh, it's in council ownership. Uh, but too often when they're not, uh, buildings of immense historical and cultural value uh, are lost forever. Uh, I mentioned earlier the, the coal exchange uh, where the first million pound cheque was signed back, back in 1984. <coughs> this was it a few years ago. Uh, you can just about make out some of the fencing, the barriers and the <coughs> plants growing out of the chimney. <coughs> Left to decay by a succession of uh, private owners that simply couldn't build the capital uh, to restore it to anywhere near its, its former glory. And in fact, the council in the end did have to intervene not to go into the building, that was beyond our means as well, but actually to make the building safe because the fear that it was literally going to collapse. In the end, I'm pleased to say we were able to facilitate the transition of the building to uh, an investor who's now done the building good, restored it, reopened it as a hotel. The former trading floor is now their main dining room. If you are visiting Cardiff, that is a great place to stay. I would uh, highly recommend it. Of course, and I'm not on commission, by the way. <coughs> of course, not all stories have, um, have such happy endings. Uh, and a few years ago, I was involved very locally in a campaign to save uh, a building known as the Splot University Settlement. Uh, apologies for the, the blurriness of, of, the, of the picture. A uh, building in, in, in my ward, I don't know if you're familiar with the University Settlement Movement, uh, Toynbee Hall in London, uh, it's probably the most famous example. This was the, the only uh, example of this kind established in Wales, uh, one of the few uh, historically and architecturally significant buildings uh, within the ward that, that I represented. Uh, and so with, with help from, from many, including uh, the late Gavin Stamp, who uh, was Pilotti uh, in, in, in Private Eye, um, I actually wrote the spot listing application to Cardew, to the, to the Welsh Heritage Body, to try and get this listed. Um, they said no unfortunately, and um, it's now flattened. Uh, and, and too often, through poor planning legislation, uh, you know, the council didn't want to get this demolished, but we didn't have the planning levers to stop it. Through um, the rigidity of that process, 
as well as bureaucracy sometimes within heritage organisations, it can cost communities precious assets. But let's not end on a negative, shall we? Uh, let's end on a positive, which ties me back to the point I made earlier about that need for a, a whole ecosystem approach. Uh, some of you may have heard of Womanby Street in Cardiff. Uh, it is a street with a, a cluster of live music venues, the beating hearts, really, of live music in Cardiff, where band, in the past bands like Stereophonics and Coldplay have cut their teeth before moving on to, to bigger venues. <clears throat> Around 18 months ago, uh, a, developer, a developer planned to take over one of the empty properties uh, on the streets uh, and build uh, a block of new apartments, which would, in turn, have put the future of the nightclubs on the street at risk because you could have anticipated noise complaints from the residents of the new, uh, of the new flats. Without uh, an agent of change principle uh, in place in the planning system at the time, uh, the council as an authority would have been largely toothless to prevent uh, such, such complaints. And so a substantial grassroots, grassroots campaign developed to try and save Womanby Streets. They mobilised, they campaigned, and they made a lot of noise. And then following the local government election uh, in 2017, when I became leader, uh, we listened and we were able to respond uh, quite innovatively, I think. Uh, in this case, we stepped in and we bought the land off the developer. And now we're working with the um, adjacent nightclub to, in, in, to expand their offer and enhance uh, live music on that, on, that, um, on that street. We recognised as a council that if Cardiff lost this centre of alternative music, then the city would be diminished and that, uh, that's, that, that, that ladder uh, for bands from their local clubs to their stadium, uh, stadium venues would be lost in, in Cardiff. So the campaign has led now to Welsh Government embedding the agent of change principle within the <coughs> planning framework, but it's also prompted a surge of interest in Cardiff's music scene, with Cardiff declaring ourselves to be a music city and the council commissioning sound diplomacy to work with all stakeholders in Cardiff to develop a music strategy that protects and enhances, and, and enhances musical life as a central part of our city. And for me, this episode really demonstrates that culture is a fragile thing. It requires careful nurturing and protection for it to flourish. But then when it does flourish, the returns it delivers, in economic terms, yes, in terms of placemaking, but critically in terms of enriching our lives, those returns are absolutely worth striving for. And it's why I believe a modern city without culture at its heart is a city without a heart at all. So thank you for your time today, and in the time available, I'll take any questions. Well, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's within the planning framework, um, so it's recognising that uh, there is a, um, a, a prior ease happening on, on, a, on a building or, or in an area, uh, which means that there is priority given to that uh, prior ease, in effect, given what, what, what comes next. So uh, if, for example, a residential uh, development was to be built next to a live music venue, the fact that uh, the residential development was, was the agent of change uh, gives uh, the, the planning authority, or the licensing authority, as, as it, I guess it would be, um, the, the ability to resist uh, calls for closing down the, the music venue uh, on the grounds that he was there prior to you know, whatever was generating the, the, the complaints. So, that so. embedded in the local plan. So off the back of, this, of, of that grassroots campaign, it's now been adopted at a Welsh Government level, uh, there is a campaign uh, at a UK level, I think, to adopt the si similar measures uh, in England. I'm not sure how far they've got. Uh, it's, it's ground to a halt. It's ground to a halt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Labour government in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be political here, can I? Right, that's fine.
Yeah, we are. Um, but it's, it's you know it's a, it's a it's a journey, isn't it? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, in in the west of Cardiff, we had two failing secondary schools, uh, both you know in, in huge deficits financially, uh, both with appalling GCSE um, outcomes. Council took the decision, in fact, to, to close both schools, create a brand new secondary school on a new on a new site, merging you know the the, the, the pupils from both schools into that designating that school uh, especially as a, as a creative school uh, and providing within the building uh, the facilities that uh, the teachers would need to deliver, deliver that curriculum but also through uh, uh, initiatives like the Cardiff Commitment uh, which is basically a, a, a process whereby businesses uh, in Cardiff sign up to providing um, work, uh, work placements, apprenticeships, uh, work experience etc offering them directly to the school so that they are able to uh, you know those those children with with a creative uh, with a creative bent can then take advantage of, of those opportunities um, you know directly another example uh, we have um, uh, a large production studio called bad wolf studios uh, which has um, taken over one of the one of the largest building uh, in buildings in cardiff turned it into uh, a series of studios um, again this is in in, in my ward uh, as part, they were they were grant funded by by Welsh government in part to do so, they have an on site classroom uh, to bring in uh, pupils from the surrounding areas to teach them about uh, various aspects of uh, the the TV and film industry, not just in front of the camera, but also you know behind the camera. And th th these are kind of like vocational skills, carpentry, woodwork, etc. Um, that people you know you don't have to be creative to work in the creative industry so there are some of the initiatives it's a, it's a work in progress isn't it but, so one of the um, big projects which, which I've not even mentioned today in fact um, that we are hoping to get off the ground in the very near future is the building of an indoor arena in, in Cardiff uh, which would again be located uh, in, in, Car in, 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 in the Bay area um, that you know, you're probably talking about 100 and 110 million pounds worth of, of investment, but we're doing that, you know, for, for twin reasons really. One is because it supports the, the cultural vibrancy of the city, but then it's because it brings visitors into the city, which spend their pound uh, in the shops, in the bars, in the restaurants across Cardiff, and the, the people living in those, uh, you know, people sorry, working in in those kinds of industries are people by and large, uh, you know, at the lower end of, of the pay scale. Uh, you'll see me wearing my living wage, real living, real living wage badge. Um, Cardiff Council is, has been for the last five years a real living wage employer accredited. Uh, but we've put funding aside now to encourage other businesses and to take them through the process of getting their own accreditation to, to pay the living wage. And uh, we celebrate you know, pretty publicly when uh, the companies um, sign up to be a, a living wage because we, we see that as, as pretty foundational to, uh, to, to, to the economy. But I guess you, you have to create the opportunities for people uh, to, to access better jobs, don't you? Uh, it can't be just a, a race to the bottom economy. You know, your, uh, you know your, your massive distribution warehouses where people are working 12 hour, uh, 12 hour days on, uh, on the minimum wage. You have to create as much value into that, into that environment, into that uh, economy as possible, and we see culture as being one of those um, one of those parts of the economy where you are creating higher value jobs, and that's why we're choosing to invest in the way we are. But you know, you're grappling with market capitalism, so how much a local authority in its own can do um, is is you know, open to debate. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a really good question, um, and it's it's a very easy attack from um, you know political opponents or you know that that half the internet that just think whatever somebody does it's the wrong thing. Why are we spending you know money on getting flash things in, into Cardiff? And I think it's you know it's, it's a legitimate question that people have to be able to to answer. In terms of the quality of access, you know, yeah, Champions League final, it's going to cost you to 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 get into right, but. Um, I scroll. No, that was um, 
a celebration of, of um, Roald Dahl uh, that took place in Cardiff, a uh, city of the unexpected, it was, it was called, and Ro Ro Cardiff is Roald Dahl's birthplace. I think we had a quarter of a million people on the streets of Cardiff that day. Um, nobody paid a, a, a penny uh, to access the events. I'm sure they probably did spend some money in the local economy, in, in the shops, in, in, in the bars. Uh, we had the National Death uh, of Wales, which is kind of one of the biggest cultural events in, in Western Europe, take place in Cardiff Bay this August. Uh, ordinarily, um, it take, this event takes place in a field uh, on a farm somewhere, big fence around it, 25 quid uh, per day to get in. For the first time ever in Cardiff, uh, well, in Wales, this, it was free. Um, and the estimate is about half a million people over the course of the week visited. So there are events being being you know created <coughs> that um, you know are open uh, freely open to, to everybody. Um, that question, the, the, the secondary question about the smaller events, I think, is a really interesting one because um, one of the areas where authorities, including my own, have stepped back from um, in in recent years with austerity is that kind of um, seed corn funding for. Um, more community-based events, you know, happening in, in, in parks and whatnot. Um, what has tended to happen is seed cord, fu seed cord funding just turned into an annual, you know, annual funding and people relied on it. So there is a real challenge to people running events, small community events, that they need to grow, you know, they need to grow that funding so that they don't have to come back to the council every year to, to, to ask for it. But we, you know, we, we, we do see it as part of a you know, a single ecosystem where if you're living in a council estate on the on the margin of the Cardiff, uh, you are, you know, by definition less likely to participate in a cultural event, even if it's free, happening in the city centre. So yeah, it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> good question. Uh, you maybe ask me again in six months' time when we are or are not building an indoor arena. Um, because I think it's uh, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's a bright, flashy building. Um, and I, I, I mentioned, you know, the pressures we are facing in children's social services and adult social services in, in homelessness. Uh, making that um, economic point and making the enriching point um, of what it brings to the cities uh, is fundamental to the success of convincing people um, to, to do that. I mean, I, I, w I would say, actually, but, you know, we... When, when Cardiff bid, for example, to host um, the Volvo Around the World Ocean Race, when we put in a bid to host um, the, the 2020 um, uh, Euro, Euros, the, the, the football championship, when, it, when Brussels, I think, wasn't ready, we did have cross-party support for that. Um, because I think, you know, <coughs> grown-up politics recognises there, there is a benefit in doing this. Um, not everybody, not everybody is a grown-up politician, but by and large, you, you get you get over the line. <laughs>